When did you go to Europe? First time I was in Europe, I went as a sophomore from Kalamazoo College. I spent four months there in school in Normandy. And uh, it was one of the moments that changed my life because I, uh, I was a little boy from Manistee who hadn't, you know, I'd been to Chicago and I'd been on an airplane before, yeah. but to get on the boat, I mean, that was back when you went on a boat. And um, you got there and they, you got off the boat and nobody spoke English. That was, you know, 67. There, you didn't have 90% of the popular, 50% of the population speaking English. And it, when you went to the bar, as a 17-year-old might do, Should uh, do, there was probably no one there who spoke your language. And so you had, to, you had to be in the moment. And of course, in those days, I was 6'2", and I was a big guy. And so walking around late at night didn't scare me because every, everybody else was four foot tall. And so I used to party hardy. And uh, there, were, there were, I think, eight of us in the group or nine of us in the group. So we did have friends that spoke English. And of course, you met the Dutch guy uh, that always wanted you to buy. And you met the English guys who would only go out with themselves. <laughs> and uh, you, you lived with a family. And uh, they, the, the, the mother was an old Viking Norman brassy blonde, big, mean woman. And the son was, was kind of a wimp. And the old man was, uh, an, I think he was an agricultural uh, official. And he spent his weeks out, out in Paris with his mistress. And eventually, Mama caught on to that. And then living in that household was a little difficult because when dad was home over the weekend, well, it was, it was fighting words. But, you know, that was, uh, by the time I was done, I wish I could stay. Sure, you've told me that before. And uh, probably a big, mis could have been a big mistake in my life to not stay. I had friends who liked it so much, they did stay and were, you know, that they guided tours and, did all the stuff, and of course, getting citizenship in France is misery. Sure, it's harder than getting citizenship in the United States. Maybe kind of simply because the bureaucracy is so horrible, and they, you know, they have the the same way I used to do at the store. Somebody comes in and asks for something, and I'd always say, "Impossible, can't be done." But let me try, and that sucks you in. Sure, and then when you finally do it you're beholden to the guy who got it done because he told you it was impossible and he was going to do it for you, just special. And that was one of the tricks. Yeah. That was one of the tricks. And you can use that. I can't get it, but let me try. Yeah, but every, you know, you do, you do stuff for 50 years and uh, you get to meet all kinds of people. And I've, I've met all kinds, you know, hundreds and hundreds of wonderful people. Thousands, probably. For thousands. And, and, you know, a few real boners. And, and I knew or knew of all the freak show people in town. And we used to think we had more than average. And we probably didn't. Every town probably has their collection, whether it was the guys that were sniffing glue they were bad. Or, you know, Hockey Dave, if you remember Hockey oh, I, Dave. Yeah, I remember Hockey Dave. Hockey uh, Dave. Who, what a character. Who was, who was a character. And by and large, kind of, uh, kind of harmless. And his dad, Ray. And Ray was a, an old state policeman from the Detroit yep. area. And he'd come in the store and he was loud you know, and he always wanted to talk to me, and he was always loud, 
and he was he was a, a guy that that came that didn't respect your personal space, and so he was always you know he felt he was going to pinch you on the ass all the time, <laughs> but that was Ray, and uh, I, I I loved him because he would bring me everything, you know. I yeah, if he wanted to buy a walrus, he would have come to me to get him a walrus because I was the guy who did that for him. So I mean. It says a lot what you're saying right now about you know people would come to you. Now, the store, more hardware, has been running continuously for over a hundred years. Over a hundred years, yeah. And it, it, can you give those that are watching that don't necessarily know the history of how it started and and, and all the way up to to today? Somewhere around uh, 1913, Grandpa John came off the farm and you know, the family was in free soil. And the, the war, fa there are very few wars in the, in the world, very few wars in the country. And one of the landing spots was, was free soil. Some went north and some went south, where the north branch, and a lot of, a lot of them went to Ludington and then south, there's some in Muskegon. And um, the family farm is still there. The, the, the house is derelict, but John came to town with his new bride, Rose Bielski, of all things, and um, he bought into the Central Hotel, which is the building on the north end of the block that uh, now is a, a, a cleaning guy, a guy okay. like, yeah. Yep, yep, I know what you're talking yeah, about. It used to be Larry Kessler's place, and before that it was the, something else and something else. I bought it from from the home furniture when they were dissolving. And um, anyway, he bought, he bought into the hotel, and this is an apocryphal story. Of course, I make things up all the time. That's okay. But I think Rose got sick and tired of cleaning up the hotel yeah and told John you got to move on I may I don't know if that's true might be an embellishment but that was certainly the way she was and um, so John moved next door with John Meyer and they made they, they bought this livery stable that uh, that we don't have any record of but it was a livery stable, and uh, they went in and they tended horses and they sold farm implements and um, they, uh, you know, it, it went on. John Meyer's sons worked there, and and then John War's sons worked there during the depression, so they were they were full. And of course, John's brother, cousin, cousin Tony, worked there. A lot of stories about Tony. Great, huge man. Maybe not the brightest fellow in the world, but my brother describes him as going down. He, he saw him do this. They would go down to the rail yards to get stuff for the store, mm -hmm. and Tony could walk in and reach over into a stack of kegs and nails, grab it by the edge, and pick it up. Strong guy. That was, yeah. And I mean, he was a gentle giant, but he was, and I, I, I remember him personally. But uh, anyway, that, so the, it was family, double family business, which of course is doomed in the long run. <laughs> and as the 30s came on, of course, every, everything was tough. Story from there, a guy came in and wanted uh, John to sell him some rope and he wanted 20 feet of rope and my grandpa said to him 20 feet of rope what good is that what are you going to do hang yourself with it and of course yep that's what he did Jesus Christ. well back then you know farmers didn't buy 20 foot of rope I mean, sure. 20 foot of rope you can hardly tie a canoe to the top of a truck you know and uh so it made some sense to John to, to say that. And, uh, of course, he never asked anybody that again. And we were all told not to ask 
people might question. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the, as, as the 30s went on, the, the, of course, the horses went away. And uh, farm implements kind of hung on. But they started selling appliances because now who, who they sold them to in the 30s, I don't know, because Manistee was sore pressed during the 30s. There are a couple books about that. But anyway, they, um, they moved on with uh, all the, the farm stuff. And then the appliances, that was my dad's thing. Okay. Because they were all the sons of the Wars and the Myers were competing as to who was going to get to stay and who was going to go. And so, you know, the dad, my dad, who's, who's known as Barney, okay. whose real name was Norbert, and uh, he got his, his nickname from Barney Google with the goo goo googly eyes, honest to God, truth. And he... Um, he he had a bunch of stories that that were are worth telling, uh, because he was a, a dance band musician. And uh, we're setting up a little thing at the store today, with a picture of the boat that sank in Lake, Lake Superior that he was in the he was in the dance band on that boat when it hit the reef at Copper Harbor at uh, Isle Royal. They got him off. Sure. Obviously, he didn't die there, but. Uh, so we got all those stories that are fascinating to me and nobody else. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the, the 40s came and uh, the Meyer family kind of started to walk away simply because they had other interests. They ended up in Cadillac and, and did very well. I think for a while they were making boats. For a while they were making uh, winter clothing, stuff like that. And um, several years ago, the, the Meyer son, not the original John, but the, the, his son who had worked at the store was brought around by his son on his final tour of his childhood haunts. And I got to spend some time with him and hear his stories and, and how they, you know, diverged from out of the war family stories. And uh, so that, that was pretty interesting. And then by 54, 52, uh, John bought, Grandpa John bought out John Meyer. And in the meantime, to, to add the other section, Uncle Frank, my Uncle Frank, who was Barney's brother, had pushed the, uh, the business into propane a bottle of propane. So we were in the propane business, which which meant we had two trucks and we had all these guys out on the road delivering propane. And it probably wasn't very, you know, monetarily very successful. Of course, selling refrigerators isn't necessarily very successful either. And um, they used to fight. We had an open office, sort of like this, in the back of the store, up a little higher so that the, the bookkeeper could sit there and look out over, over the store. And uh, there, there were a couple of roll-top desks in there. And when Barney and Frank disagreed, they would be in the open office. And it was not unheard of to see the two of them swinging at each other during the day in the office. So they didn't get along with the dam. And uh, anyway, eventually Dad bought out Frank, and he had a bookkeeper whose name was Margaret Dorfeld, and Margaret was a wonderful, wonderful lady who decorated the living hell out of her house. And she decided that War Hardware should sell giftware. And... For whatever reason, Dad agreed, and so they they got a little eight by eight wooden platform and bought a little bit of giftware as it was at the time, 
and it was successful. And and Margaret could then buy stuff for her house at, at cost. And her her daughter, by the way, is retired to Manistee, and a wonderful, wonderful lady again. And and I have uh, you know only good things to say about the Dorfeld family. They were wonderful, and and they taught me a lot of stuff. And uh, their stories about uh, her, her Margaret's father that uh, I can tell, but not in front of a camera. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, so that that started the the giftware section, and yeah. and eventually, I don't know if you probably don't remember it, but the whole the the whole front of the the Division Street south end of the store was all glass. Yep, and we had glass shelves in it, and it was full of of uh, you know glass, colored glass, and milk glass, and things that were in mm -hmm. and uh, like I said Margaret decorated her house and the style then was early American if, if for those of you who remember Ann Wittig you obviously don't but she was another person whose house was early American and it meant that every inch of the house every inch of the walls everything every flat surface had something sitting on it and it was all Americana. And of course, nowadays, that's anathema. It's just, you would walk into a place like that and say, where am yeah, I? Yeah, there's too much shit. Yeah, there's too much shit. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll tell you a story about what eventually turns into an economic story. Somewhere along the line, we got into a program. The old man got into a program selling toys for Christmas. And it was a brilliant, it was a brilliant program. This company would buy toys, and it was called the Child's Guidance Council. And they would buy specific toys, and they tried to buy toys that were educational, well-made, and a good value. Mm -hmm. I mean, and they really did try to do that. And for, at the time, maybe $2,000 or $3,000, which then was a lot of money. Worth of toys. Worth of toys. Yeah. You could be in the toy business. And so we would set up two islands in the middle of the store with these toys. And the, the, the trick, because there's always a trick, right, is they publish these little catalogs. So as part of the 2000 or $3,000, you got a 1,000 catalogs or some, some, something like that. And I remember my job was to distribute them to the local grade schools so the kids could take them home and check off the things they wanted. Now, in today's world, of course, we would say that should be illegal. <laughs> and because, and I don't know if it should be. I, I don't know. I mean, the only thing that I can see about it that was wrong is that the school let us distribute it on. on the yeah. But otherwise, I mean, it was, it was a good deal for the, the parent because... They knew they could get something locally that the child wanted, that someone had reviewed the quality of the product and it had some value. And it was great for us. Sure. You know, because by the time Christmas Eve came around, the toys were gone. And I, I don't know what we made on them. I, you know, I was, that was, I was a kid. Sure. I wasn't privy to that information. But it was a good deal, and of course, it was taken away by the courts because they said there was no standing for this company to claim that they knew about the value of toys. Well, uh, and obviously, there I got somebody with my cane. Anyway, that you know, I assume that was brought by the up-and-coming companies like. Kmart. 
Sure. You know, where we, the, the companies that eventually killed the toy business completely in the United States killed all the toy stores. You can't, there's nowhere you can go to go to, to a toy store. I don't think the flagship um, toy store in, in New York is still there. FAO Schwartz, I think they're gone, which is, good heavens, and now now all we can do is order toys online. Yeah. How sad, you know, but, it is. but anyway, that was that was the story of the toys at War Hardware, and um, there's another story about Scott's fertilizer that goes, it comes from the same collection of stuff, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you the great Christmas story. Please. The great Christmas story was Somewhere along the line, the old man decided we should have a Christmas party on Christmas Eve. And so he would get shrimp and roll-ups and crab cocktail and, and it was posh for those Did it days. Upright. It was nice. And an open bar. <laughs> and an open bar where you could pour your own. And so at noon on Christmas Eve, in would come all the guys from town. Sure, I would. And you would. <laughs> it was sort of like when Kyle does the, yeah, the men's night. The men's night. Only it was much better than that. Because nobody thought it was naughty. You sure. know, everybody thought it was cool. And I remember the judges, Max Hamlin, uh, dropping names. Freddie, Freddie Closet. I mean, names from the past. Somebody out there will remember them, <laughs> uh, but not many of us, sure, right? Sure, sure. But I can say that because they're gone. You know, yeah. they're out in Oak Grove, and they're, they're not going to take any offense. <laughs> and anyway, they, these guys would come, and the lawyers. I remember my good buddy Bruce Gockerman coming, and and uh, John DeVries, and, and uh, when he was really a young man, uh, uh, anyway. But the lawyers were there, and the, the, the dentists were there, and the doctors were there. And after half an hour, you know, everybody's sitting around stewing and drinking and, and uh, pounding down shrimp. And the next thing you'd know, they'd go over to one of the girls that worked at the store, or the women that worked at the store, and say, I need a gift from my wife. Yeah. What do you got? <laughs> and they'd say, how much you want to spend? And they'd say, X. And they'd say, well, I'll wrap it for you and bring it to you. It was great business. Sure. I bet. It was wonderful. Because, <laughs> you know, and of course the rule was, what's, you know, what have we got the most of? What costs the most? That's what they get, and and those were the days back in the early '60s and, and late '60s that, um, you know, women didn't expect a thoughtful gift from their husband because men weren't very thoughtful about gifting their wives. They didn't walk around scratching their heads saying, what can I give her that will really make her happy? I need a box, right? I need a box with something in it. And so they were happy. Everybody was happy. And then one year, the insurance salesman came. And he sat down and he drank with us. And after that, he called Dad and said, can't do this. And that was the end. Yeah. How sad. Yeah. That was that was those are good times. That was the, oh it was, and I talked to somebody yesterday, one of the local judges, not not one who was old enough to have been there, but I told him that story and he just guffawed because he knew all the, you know I think I think back to John Hart and and Dan Heslin, Dan Heslin, someone who I respect tremendously. I'm so sad he's gone. And uh, Len Kelcher, our accountant, yep. Yep. and and Len, I always remember Len because when my father was failing, Len took care of him. 
went so far out of his way to take care of an old failing man. He was a prince. Glenn was just a prince to my father. And so for what what good it does now that he's gone, that there is somebody out here that remembers him and, and thinks very kindly of him. But he was always at those those parties, you know. And I suspect a lot of people were. Yeah. I mean, oh yeah. I mean what was the community like back then? Late sixties, early seventies, business wise, community wise. You shouldn't ask me this sure. because I know I too much know. about it. There was a time, and and this will lead me into a story of personalities, but I'll give you the history. There was a time that every small town in in the United States had their own bank, and Manistee was lucky enough to have two local banks. And as I understand it, and of course, some of this may be apocryphal, the, the mortgages in town, house mortgages in town, 80 to 90% of them were held by those two banks. And they were closely held, they weren't subscribed. No money out to other, not, you know now your, your loan isn't with your bank, it's sure. with some subscriber out in, you know, New York. And so capital accumulated in small towns through their local banks, which made the guys very powerful. But they were your neighbors. And I remember going to see old man Parks, Doug's father. You know Doug, I mean, mm -hmm. he's still here. And uh, his, his father was a piece of work. He was a strong, a strong personality, scared some people. But I needed 10 grand for a weekend. And I walked in and I explained to him what it was. And five minutes later, I had a check and there was no paperwork. It was a site loan for 10 grand from a, a local bank that I had to pay back in two weeks and I did. It must have been a hell of a weekend. Oh yeah, it was. <laughs> well, it was the, you know it was when when the Christmas bills were due, and I knew it sure. was I was going to have the money. Oh, I get you. And uh, but I needed to take the ten to get the discount, mm -hmm. and yep. the discount was greater than the ten, so I knew everything was going to be fine. But that was the way you could do business, and in that time period. Men started businesses on, in small companies in small towns, and they put their name on the business, and it said, Fortier Plating. I knew Larry Fortier very well. He was a buddy of my dad's. They could go to Mr. Parks or, or Vern Parkusky, who, thank God, is still with us and still sharp as a tack. They could go to those men and get local money. They could borrow from, from their, uh, their neighbor. And those were the same guys that ran the country club. That you could, if you wanted to meet them, you could go up the country club on Friday afternoon and sit down on the terrace and have a beer with them. And they were accessible. They were real people in the. And what does that make a community? Right. They, the community had power over itself be, because of capital formation was, was available locally. And then about the time of the Arab oil embargo, to the great, in, in their great wisdom, the, uh, the Senate and, and, uh, Rep and uh, House of the United States decided to allow commercial banks, the large commercial banks, to offer services to individuals, which before that was not available. So Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, all those were commercial banks, and you couldn't have, I don't know if you know this, but this, this is, new. This is the story. You, could, you couldn't have a bank account at Wells Fargo, okay. who now is well known for screwing you if you do. And 
all of a sudden, those guys could do that. And the first thing they did is they used their leverage to buy up all the little banks. And you can't blame the guys who sold because right. they came out okay. But the capital flight from small, small cities was unbelievable. It just sucked the life out of Manistee. Worse even, and, and this is documented very heavily, was the capital flight from the farming communities in the Midwest, where before, it, you know, no small farmer can, can operate without a, a, a good bank. They just can't. They can't afford to buy right. the seed. And so all of a sudden, instead of a local bank where they were borrowing from their neighbor, they had to prove it to somebody from New York. And they can't. Right. Because their business makes no sense. I mean, if, if you have to justify it on paper, you can't justify a small family farm. It just doesn't work. And so they went out because the only the only financing was available was for big corporate farms. And they the you know, that change in banking effectively destroyed the small farm in, man, in the United States. And it did pretty good of taking the community out of Manistee. And so after the oil embargo and everybody left, you're too young to remember this, but they even had uh, billboards that said, last person out of Michigan, turn off the lights. It was the destruction of the Rust Belt and everybody left. And that was when Manistee lost a bunch of talent. Because if you had if you had talent and just a little money, you left. You went to the south, you went someplace where there was something happening because the small companies that were here, the Century Boats, the Drop Forge. Michigan Chemical. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all the places like my family worked until they shut down and then shut down. Yeah, and, and they shut, shut down and they shut down. And, the, you know, the, the reason is obvious, A, that, that the capital was sucked out, that they were being bought up and, and, and butchered up by what would now be called venture capitalists. Sure. And, and so the community fell into just a horrible state because people with talent moved away, the capital rushed away, was dragged away. And it was only through the efforts of some really hardworking people <coughs> that Manistee hung on decently. And those are the guys that decided to call it the Victorian Port City. And they dressed up in stupid costumes and walked around and went went all over the state saying, come to Manistee, the Victorian port city. And I mean, objectively, there were some people who thought it was stupid as hell. <laughs> sure. But they tried, they worked yeah. very, very hard. And, and I knew, uh, for example, Jerry Smith, <coughs> was the guy who dreamed up the sleigh belt parade. Yep. And Jerry was was not well loved in the community by a lot of people. I I thought he was a great guy. And um, he he did more for the community in in retrospect we can look back and say thank you Jerry because he really did something big for this community and it put us on the map with that slave belt parade. And, and but those people busted their ass to to make something happen. And anyway to to go back when the when the time before things fell apart, one of the things that you got from that capital formation and and the guys going into business for themselves and 
and lo locally owned businesses and all that, you know, there were people that were paid off for having big egos. And so there were personalities walking up and down. And I just want to tell you a story about one of my favorite guys. And it, it's like only yesterday, but it was really 50 years, 40 years ago that I knew him. And his name was Bill Beauvais. And his son is still still with us, and uh, he's a good friend. Of, he's a friend of mine, and I, his wife is a sweetheart. And Bill was tall and thin and wiry, and he always wore a cowboy hat, and he always dressed in a fly fishing vest, and he wore cowboy boots, and he was the loudest person imaginable. And he would come in the store, and if he got 25 feet into the store and nobody took care of him, you'd hear, this goddamn place is no good. Won't you ever wait on me? What's wrong with you guys? And he was always that way. And it, it also meant that his wife would come around later and apologize. <laughs> and she, was, she was just... Uh, I was kind of ashamed of him, but I, he was wonderful. It was just, sure. it was a character. And, and so one day I saw him coming. And so I snuck up by the front door and he walked through the door and I jumped out and said, Mr. Beauvais, what can I do for you? You son of a bitch, you waited on me so soon I forgot what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was just great. It was, it was just, but guys like that, you yeah. know, that, that I remember that, you know, give, gives you a story to tell about, about, you know, people back when personality counted a lot more. Uh, you at least have a start on a personality. And, I'm and, a work in progress. <laughs> well, but the, it's hard to make that stuff work now. Yeah. Because everybody acts like they just got out of MBA school. Yeah. yeah. You got used to guys that did not act like they just got out of MBA school. I was an academic. So I went to Kalamazoo College. I went to the University of Michigan. And I thought I was going to be a university professor. And you know, I studied Latin and I learned how to read old documents and all that stuff that maybe doesn't impact the universe very hard. I enjoy it, but I don't think it saves lives. Well, what took you from that to the hardware store? I mean, obviously, uh, family business, what, but what what takes uh, everybody everywhere? It's money. So I got to the end of the line and I had to write a dissertation to get my PhD. And I was looking. But a lot of people don't know out there that you have a PhD. I don't. You don't? I didn't get it. I got everything but the dissertation. And I looked at, things were grim. I, I wasn't the top, of, top scholar. I was good, but I wasn't great. And you know, it hurts you when you find out you're not the smartest guy in the room. I'm never the smartest guy. <laughs> well, I, I usually was, you know, and sometimes I think I still am, but not really. But the old man was going to retire, and he called me up and he said, are you going to still fuck around with that, or are you going to come and, and run, take over the store for me? And I was looking at at least a couple years in Italy with no, no funding or in England. And I couldn't find any place in France that, that had the documentation I needed for what I wanted to do because I was working on market formation in, in uh, the, the late medieval period. I, like nobody knows about that except me. Well, not there are a few people that do, but not very many. You won't, 
you don't know anybody else who knows about that. No. And uh, anyway, he said, come take over the store. I'll pay a 10 grand a year, which in 1974 was a lot more than I was making as a grad student. You know, I was barely paying the rent. But I, luckily, I, I had gotten a job as the building superintendent at a, a apartment complex. So all the stuff that you have to know to keep a, a, an apartment building from falling apart, I had to do. So when I came back to the hardware store, I already knew how to do all that stuff. Fix toilets, you know, hang drapes, use anchors, yeah, you know edge of lawn, so what? You know, keep a boiler running. I knew all that stuff. I'd done it for three years, something like that. Anyway, so it was the money. You know, I, I couldn't afford, I, I couldn't see starving in a hovel in Europe. And then, then with the knowledge that medieval history is one of those disciplines where they out, they overproduce academics. And nobody ever told me that. I love the University of Michigan, but they did they they lied to me by no, not telling me that there were no jobs. Sure. So in the four years preceding my leaving, there was one tenured position filled in the United States. And they were producing roughly 12, the, the sum total of, of academia in the United States were producing about 12 PhD uh, in, in medieval history a year. So you had 48 guys fighting for one job. And that's not good odds. Hey? Sure. I mean, that's really not good odds. So I came back here. And I still had an English accent because I worked with this marvelous woman, Sylvia Thrupp, who had graduated, I believe, from Oxford and was uh, one of the very, very few women in, in medieval history at the time because England was still stuck up as hell about women in academics. And uh, she was brilliant. And and you picked stuff up from those people. And so, you know, I was kind of a stuck up academic, you know, ivory tower person. And I came back and the next thing you know, you got your hands inside somebody's toilet and somebody walked, and this, this story is true, somebody did walk through the door with a urinal and the, the, the drain, drain pipes attached Oh, so dragging listening. them on, you know, yeah. hey, I, can somebody help me fix this? And the answer was, yeah, I guess. You know, I, why not? It does lead me back to to the uh, the living room of Charles Trinkus, who was a, a famous, famous uh, Renaissance uh, scholar. And I took a... Uh, I took, I took a seminar from him, and of course it was intellectual history, which just drowned my ass. I hated intellectual, yeah. I still do. And uh, I thought I was, I was just getting murdered in this class. And uh, I remember one week, we, uh, the, the assignment, this was for five books to read. None of them, none of which were in English. And I got in there, and he called on me about a passage in Cicero. And he said, how did you translate this? And I had to say, I didn't. I read the Penguin English, you know. So I knew what it said, but I, I didn't translate it. Yeah. And I, and I thought, this is it, you know, I'm, I'm going to bomb this course. And then the evening came when his, his, um, his air conditioner wouldn't work. 
and he said, Don, you know anything about air conditioners? Because he knew I grew up in a hardware store. Next thing I knew, everybody else was talking about Cicero, and I was fixing the air conditioner. And at the end of the evening, the air conditioner was working. And the next week, he called me into his office and said, I think you ought to drop medieval history and come and be my student in Renaissance. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so, you know, a self-aggrandizing story, but it was fun. Yeah. Anyway, I got back here, and, I, you know, I used to sit in the office in the back, and eventually I figured out that that wasn't going to work, that you had to, you had to talk to the people that walked through the door. And so I moved my, my operation up front. And so when people walked in and wanted to talk to the boss, there I was, right there, right now. I used to love that shit coming in there as a kid, and you were sitting there. Yeah. Typically drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. Yeah. That oh, was yeah, you smoked time. like a chimney. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the um, I discovered that when somebody walked in and greeted you, if you went up to him and shook his hand, that ordinarily workers especially workers in Manistee, were not used to having someone shake their hand. And they really, that was, that was a pleasure for them. It, it leveled the field very nicely. And I can't tell you how many thousands of dirty hands I, I've shaken. And it never hurt me. It was always a good thing to yeah. do. And I learned very early on how, how Hard, hard physical labor, hard work is much more important than academics, much more important than the ivory tower stuff. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I still read history and I still, you know, dream about that stuff. But the truth is the guys that work with their hands have taught me an awful lot. I'm so lucky to have them in my background. I've, got, I've had the opportunity to have so many wonderful experiences. And I think back on, you know, right now I, I, I think of the three Helminiacs that, that, that I know, Tim and, and uh, the guys from Dale and Kevin, with whom I have virtually nothing in common. Sure. They allowed me, they, they put up with my stupid shit and allowed me to be their pal. And thank you guys, really thank you. And that was important to me, to have friends like that. People that, that actually honestly worked. So, then there are other stories. Once upon a time, there was a lady that were, and I had, oh God, I used to employ all these kids. You know, all, all the guys that worked their way through high school at War Hardware. And most of them come back and say it was the best job they ever had because they learned something, probably because of how old they were and how I used to not Sure. I thumb on top of them like I probably should have. But some of them have gone on to great things. I mean, really, you know, successful people. I think of Michael Drew, who's now a big, kind of big cheese in Air Force intelligence. Great kid. Um, and and there, there, were, there were all kinds. Of, and I, I apologize to all the ones that I should mention that I can't or can't remember. But there were several that were that were fun, and I remember one of them who called me one night, who who had borrowed his father's Lincoln, and of course there might have been some beer involved. And he called me at three o'clock in the morning because he did not want to call his stepfather and tell him that he was in the chug. Oh, you had to bail them out? So Don went and bailed them out. 
and uh, I've held that over him for <laughs> as you should uh, forever. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure a lot of people know Dave Thompson, mm -hmm. our judge. He worked for me, and he. Uh, one day I went and I said, "Dave, we've got to paint the back dock where the receiving room dock where we, the trucks pulled up." And he said to me, I don't know how to paint. And I said, bullshit, everybody knows how to paint. You just stay in the lines. And he said, no. And I said, yeah, yeah, go. Go do that. Go and so Dave went and he did that. And at the end of the day, I walked out back to check his work. And I never asked him to paint. <laughs> and I am going to time stamp him. that one. <laughs> I saw his uh, I saw his wife yesterday, and she will not let him paint to this day. Then there was the day that one of them, I don't I don't know if you remember this, but there was a time where there there, there was a uh, a program at the high school where they built houses. I I, I think I do remember something like that. Roy yeah. Delmont, Delmont was his name and. He was a party hardy guy, and but he, but he he did a great thing for the kids in the community. He taught them how to build houses, and that was that was really good. But one of one of my boys decided that he had had a run in with uh, Delmont, and so he he was out on delivery in the store truck, and he decided he would drive across. The newly sod or newly seeded lawn of this new house, and of course that was a nightmare. It's a good thing Delmont and I were friends on the outside, and uh, it wasn't the same guy, but it was kind of sort of the same guy who who came in one day. It was the same period, and I heard him come into the store kind of breathless. And he looked up and he said, it's okay, Don, nobody saw me. <laughs> nobody saw what? Yeah. And uh, then one day the police came. And uh, they came through the store and they say, is Bob here? And I said, yeah, Bob's here. And they went out back and found Bob. Next thing I knew, they were walking him through the store in cuffs. And he'd been selling weed off the back dock at the <laughs> store. And, you know, as far as I was concerned, I I didn't mind him selling weed. I, that didn't bother me. At the store, uh, that was that was a marginal call. I shouldn't have done that. But as they were taking him out with a big smile on his face, he screamed, Hey, Don, does this mean I lose my job? <laughs> that was a... So we're bringing bringing into the uh, you know the '90s and the and the 2000s, you know where where the store. Uh, well, we had we had a run in the Christmas world. It was spectacular. I had a dream about that last night. How I was going to try to revive that. Where that came from, God, I don't know, but I wish it would go away. Uh, we were very very lucky. We had talented staff. And I've always had very talented staff and, and people that bought into the culture of taking care of people. And we, we started a long time ago. Dad, Dad had an idea that you should be able to sell a Christmas ornament that was five bucks at the time. You know, and, and what was the, that part of the store called? The Hitching Post. The Hitching Post. So I knew people from... All, various parts of the state, oh, yeah. some parts of the country, that would come during, you know, the holiday season just to get a specific ornament that they couldn't get anywhere else. Yeah, it was it was a wonderful deal, and and it was very successful. And it, we grew it too fast, and we didn't we didn't um, we didn't maintain the capital. Okay. We kept we kept growing, and and I I thought you know you sort of like guy playing craps that always is betting on the roll, 
and without put without sticking any back in his pocket. And that was that was a shame. But we had we had a great time, and it was a boom time sure. <clears throat> for gift stores. It was the lead up to the two thousand crisis. To, you know the Y two K. Y two K. And every everybody was doing pretty good. Days of their investments were doing well, and the Nasdaq was flying. So. You know, people who had a little money had a lot of money, or they thought they did, you know, because they somehow thought that that was real money. And I remember, you know, watching the stock market every day saying, oh, good, I, you know, I buy crazy tech stocks and stuff. Anyway, it was a period when average guys, average people, but because it really was women, would look at things they called collectibles, which, by the way, your spell checker will throw out. Because as we don't recognize it as a real word, we shouldn't have ever recognized it as a real thing. But companies would have a run of 100,000 yeah. angels and say, this Limited. is a collectible. Well, it's not a collectible because there are 100,000 of them. And it was the period when uh, Department 56 villages were the hottest ticket in the world. I mean... The Christmas villages? The Christmas villages. Yeah, yeah. On the day they discontinued some, they would discontinue some every year to drive their, their aftermarket price up. And we would, we would go in at 6 in the morning to take phone calls from all over the country. Do you have any of, you know, this church? Yeah? Okay, here's my credit card number. Ship it to me. And and for a day, it, we, we couldn't stop phones hard, hardly enough. enough. That's and wild you'd, you'd to me. And you'd sell $15,000 worth of village pieces in a day. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, that was also the period of the the Beanie Baby. Yeah, I remember that shit. <laughs> and that's a long story. But it was insane. People would follow the UPS truck to see if you got a shipment of Beanie Babies on any given day because they wanted them so much. And if you look back at they were a $5 stuffed toy yeah. that were well-designed, had beautiful fabric, and were worth $5. But now that you have 60 of them and no kids, yeah. what's wrong with you? And there are lots of people who now have 60 of them and their kids are grown and they've got this bag that the Salvation Army won't take. Are they still good, viable toys for children? Yes, they are. So it turns out that Mr. Ty, who owned the Beanie Baby, it was his baby, if you will, went to Kalamazoo College. And he was a Sherwood, like I was, in the fraternity, Sigma Rho Sigma. It was an only only at Kalamazoo College, so nobody else gets to be one. And of course, it's long gone, so there are no new ones. So it's just us old guys who remember. But he hit the jackpot. Mm -hmm. I mean, he hit the jackpot. And so, as a as a fraternity, we got together and wrote him a letter that said, "We're your brothers. Throw us a party." And he wrote back and said, I'm not your brother. Throw your own party. Yeah. So my respect for him went spiraling down the toilet. Anyway, like I said, I've had some interesting experiences. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. And, uh, but the, there were all these things that worked so well. And we had angels that people wanted. And 
it, it always shocked me to, to be an atheist that made his living selling angels. You know, it didn't seem right. But then I think of Kurt Adler, which was this big company that we bought Christmas ornaments from. And we bought tons of Christmas ornaments, and they were a very big player in the marketplace, and they still are. But it was run by Jews. And that's all they did was sell Christmas ornaments. And I remember Kurt Adler very well because um, of their collections manager. And, you know, there were times that we got behind. And he would call. It was Gino from New Jersey. And when Gino called, you send him a check. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the, the, and there was an angel thing for a while where there was an angel store in Manistee. Didn't last long. I mean, how? But everything had an angel on it. You get soap with an angel, you get. You know, purses with angels. And how many angels can you sell? How many angels? Well, how many people are going to buy into that? I don't know. Um, what ultimately happened with the hitching post? 2000 came. And three things happened. The powers that be tanked the market. and took, took profits off all the people who had invested so heavily, which I thought, I think is, was probably intentional that there was yeah, being, you know, not a, a great believer in cabals of revolving around big money. And so all of a sudden the people who had invested so heavily in these things didn't have the cash to buy it. And then even more importantly, the internet came. And you can appreciate this because I'm sure I check your wine prices on online. I'm sure many of your, your people do. I don't complain about price with you because you're pretty close most of the time. But what happened is people bought these things, like the department villages, department 56 villages, thinking they were going to be able to make money on them in the aftermarket. We met people who traveled the country in airstreams with their airstream full of department 56 villages, and they'd go from town to town to the dealers to see if they could sell, buy things they didn't have and sell things that they wanted to move. And they made a living doing that. Really? I mean, that was the kind of market it was. And if you went to the the uh, the shows, people would set up with their rare Department 56 mm -hmm. buildings and sell them for two to three times what the, the original retail was. And so it seemed like an investment. And when you were if you were at one of these swap meets, and you had the only St. Paul's Cathedral, and you wanted $500 for it, there might very well be somebody at that swap meet who would give you five. But as soon as you put it on the internet and find out that there are 500 people out there that have a St. Paul's that want to move it, all of a sudden it's 50 bucks. Yep, the price goes down. It's fine to me. And that absolutely destroyed that market that we call the collective. Decimate. So, one one year we had we sold a hundred thousand dollars worth of Beanie Babies. Are you ready? Can you even imagine? That's a lot of Beanie Babies, dude. At five dollars a piece, yeah. you damn betcha in a town <laughs> of five thousand people. And once that goes, yeah. once people realize that they're duh, I shouldn't be buying these. There's nothing you could put in your store to replace those dollars. Nothing. Oh, yeah. Once it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. 
Yeah. 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 Well, Typical pet about. rock problem. Yeah. And so our, you know, within two years, our uh, gross sales dropped by 50%, and then another year by another 50%, and all of a sudden, yeah. it was, it was, uh, we, were, we had too much inventory, we had too many staff, we had too much area devoted to it. And you can only back off, you can never back off fast enough when it's going down that fast. It's just, um, and, and of course, emotionally, it's a, it's a disaster because they're all your buddies and you don't want to fire anybody. And it just sucked, it was awful. Yeah. And it was a wonderful business. I, I can't tell you. They used to fly us to New York. They used to fly us to Chicago to buy. Holy shit. How good is that? You know, of course, when, you, when you, you're selling a million dollars with the gigas. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the uh, the Christmas village I have at my house came from the Hitchin Post. I'm sure. I'm pretty, almost 100% yeah. sure. And they're still beautiful things. I mean, They are. The fact that they don't have... Resale value. Yeah. Well, we're not trying to resale. If if you have we put it out. if you can get personal value from it, yeah. It's it's great. A seven year old sets it up. Yeah. That's the joy I get out of yeah. it. Yeah. You know. And those are those it. are great things. But the the biggest thing that happened was the internet. The internet just and it happened to all gift stores in the country. Chicago used to be a main place to go and buy gifts. There used to be five places in the country where you'd go and they had all these showrooms and fancies. Yeah. And now there are only two. Sears and JCPenney catalogs back in the day before yeah. the internet, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's hard being in a, in a niche, um, small market, knowing that a click away you can get something. It's lazy. It's, it's very, very difficult to compete yeah. against. And the internet has been one of the things that is, has pounded small business. You know that. Um, we, can, we can make all kinds of... You know, we can beat our chests and we can say, oh, we're better than that and our service is better. And the truth is, yes, we're better than that and our service is better because... All you have to do is try to talk to somebody that's taking care of your account on the internet. You know that that's a problem. They they don't want anybody talking to you. It's just uh, our recent experience with UPS returns for Amazon points. They now have a, a, a deal where when you go to return something to Amazon, it automatically sends you a QR code. What they don't tell you is the only only a verified UPS store can process that QR code, which for us means you have to drive to Cadillac to, to send it back. Mm -hmm. Now, who dreamed that up? Somebody that didn't want it back. Not somebody who's into customer service. Yeah. And so... I remember, which reminds me of a story. One of my best friends from college, Jack Orr, speaking of the smartest guy in the room, Jack uh, was a scientist. And he kept me up abreast of all kinds of things. He worked for, as a toxicologist for drug companies. And he forecasted the disaster with uh, OxyContin. I knew that was coming 10 years before it hit the papers. Pretty big disaster. Anyway, he, he once, we were sitting around smoking too much. And we decided we were going to call somebody. <clears throat> and we didn't have their number. So we were, that was back when there was a, a number you called. And some woman somewhere, or guy, picked up the phone and looked up a number for you. Which most, I, I think if I told a kid that today that that actually happened, they'd tell me I was a liar. And 
it turns out that they they the, the thing rang about four times and that somebody picked it up. And Jack and I were hired in kites, and he said to me, "You know, it wasn't cigarettes." <laughs> no. Anyway, he said to me, "You know the." phone company doesn't get this right. If you reward somebody that quickly, they're going to use that service more. They should have a, a minimum of 15 rings before somebody picks that up. And he wrote them a letter saying, you know, you're training everybody to depend on this and they should really look it up themselves. And sure enough, within a year, when you went to go and get a, a Give me the number operator, 15 rings. They built it in, made it more difficult. And of course, now they just took it away. Yeah. You know, tough shit. But that, um, anyway, I had a good time yesterday. I had hundreds of people coming in, telling, you know, tear in their eye, telling me how they were going to miss me. It was a while there. I thought I was at Herbert's. Well, I mean, so like, the store's closing. The store's closing. You're retired. Yeah. Um, do you have tenants taking over? I, yeah, I've got two tenants in two of the buildings, and and we will see what happens in, in the rest. I have some some interest from other places. And, um, you know, God willing, things things work out quickly and easily. It's none of this stuff is without their bumps and grinds, you know. It's sad. But sad. A lifetime. Yeah, some someday I'll, I've got lots more personality stories for you. Well, I have a story and yes. I've, and I've said the story to numerous people over the years. Uh, over the last 7 years because that's how old my daughter is. When my youngest daughter was born. We were gifted an antique uh, crib. Yes. And when I got it home, you might remember this. When I got it home, uh, there was a an old, like very unique looking bolt that I was missing. And I came. To, well, actually, my wife Betsy said, "Just take it to Don. I'm sure he's got something down there. I don't think he's going to have this. I mean, the the crib itself was uh, very old. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say a hundred years old, but very old." And uh, I walked in, and you immediately, like you always do, said, hi, what are you looking for today? Which is perfect. And uh, I said, well, Don, I'm looking for, and before I could even say it, you said, oh, that's for an antique baby crib. Follow me. And you took me to the back of the store and opened up a box. And the box is full of dust, because clearly <laughs> there's not a huge market for antique baby crib bolts. Right. And uh, you took the bolt out, and you said, 18 cents. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Well, you I'll know, never forget it. You don't it, get that kind of service anywhere. Something to remember is once somebody does something a hundred thousand times, they should get good at it. Yeah, I mean, I feel if like if they I, don't, shame on them. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of shit to remember. Well, yeah. Will's got the the great memory. He's got better memory than I do. You know, he remembers numbers. I don't, but. Yeah, you know, it's it it's too bad that he couldn't continue it. Uh, it's not it's not deep in his heart. It takes a specific kind of person to run their own business. Yeah, as you probably know, there are a lot of people that think they want to do it, and then they find out that it sucks. Yeah, it's a grind, and. Um, There are a lot of people who try it and don't do so well, whether it's because of their personality or because things just didn't work. Uh, there's nothing. There's nothing certain about operating a business, even an old business. Believe me, it has can fail. Can can uh, can be difficult, and I don't know that it's easier now. I think it's much harder now than it used to be. Again, because of capital formation things and community, 
I, I think back, I look at the Manistee and say how many how many new businesses in town have started since the, the early 90s that are still here and there aren't many you know the, the ones that you know you think of Snyder's and Link, uh, Link Body Shop and those guys Link is probably like, those two are probably the oldest ones left after I go it used to be Olson Lumber and, and then me and now probably Link Lumber, maybe, maybe Snyder, I don't know. But how they live on the edge of a razor all the time. Corporate, a corporate company comes in, they can have their ass in an instant. And you know, I, I, I talked to an accountant yesterday who came in a guy I respect very much, and he was telling me how, you know, how much he thought I did. Uh, now I was a good guy and all that stuff, which I appreciated. But I said to him, I, I hope you realize how tenuous your existence is, because all you need is one corporate, you know, one corporation that has sixteen accountants for 10 grand a year, then move in and you're done. And that, that of course, your wife knows that, and you know that, that, she, that industry is now being turned over to people who work, they're, they're like pharmacists. Right. It used to be, God, you remember Miller's? No, you don't remember Miller's. Miller's was next door where that, the, the uh, grocery store is next to us, the organic food store. And there used to be a, 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 a pharmacy there, and Miller's had a snack bar. <laughs> they had a snack bar, and you could get sodas. They had actually soda water, and they, they made Coke. And they they did ice cream sundaes and all that shit. And Grandpa John and his buddies used to go over there in the afternoon. They, they'd spend every afternoon. I mean, and I remember those guys. One was Mr. Bottrell. You know the Bottrells? Yep. And that would they'd be their grandfather. And Fortier. And... And I I remember these guys like it was yesterday because because to me it was yesterday but now it's fifty years later and uh, but you could get sandwiches and you could get and Mary Beth Hughes that she's still around drove bus for years and years oh, yeah. she uh, she worked there when I was a kid and I can I remember all it, it but what fun to go to a pharmacy that had a and that's back when sailors was down where the outpost is now and they had a um, they had a snack bar there was a snack bar here along mm -hmm. that wall and that this was this was a hot spot for after school Berglunds Berglunds you'd come down here and sit there trying to avoid walking up the street to Division Street to go to work. Anything you could do to postpone until, yeah, the, old, until the old man found you and got mad. <clears throat> when this was City Drug, when John Kayser owned it, you know, I knew a lot of people that worked that work here yeah. you know, for him, too. And it was kind of an end of an era when City Drug closed. It was like, you know, big changes. There aren't any drugstores. Nope. There aren't any, that's gone. And those people used to run their own businesses. Now there are going to be three three kinds of drugstores, and that's it. Four, maybe. Yeah. And every, every every grocery store is a pharmacy now, and I understand the convenience. Um, again, what does that do to community? 
what does that do when when you you want to have everybody on the block have a have a sidewalk sale or you know you say you go and say we're going to we're going to put up uh, pink ribbons for breast cancer what what do you do when you when you go to cor you know into a corporate drugstore or a corporate this or a corporate that and say will you put a pink ribbon in the window they say go away yeah yeah we don't we don't need you we we don't that's not part of our corporate culture sorry remember Olson the grocery store Hell my yeah. god the things they did for this community how wonderful they were all you have to do is go over to the senior center and they'll tell you because Olson's always provided the birthday cakes for the, the seniors at the senior center. Monthly birthday cakes. I love, you know, Myers is, is not a bad company. They started small. Sure. My uncle worked for Fred Meyer when he had four stores. And so I, I know bit about that and, and you know he had, he always loved the produce department and he, but anyway and they still do some of that stuff yeah but not like Olson's did Olson's was part of the community again community and how important that is and and how we're missing it we're missing it because the the companies that come in aren't invested they don't have skin in the game in the town when when i was a kid sands park right you know where sands park is every night in the summer we have six nights a week the lights were on and they were playing baseball okay. anyway park. the companies would sponsor their baseball teams hardy's had Four or five teams. Oh yeah, uh, I played for Hardy's. Did you really? No <laughs> shit. And Morton's the same thing. Yep. And Martin Marietta and yep. PCA. They all had teams, and and you go, you'd go there at night, and they were all they, they weren't kids. They were men playing ball, and the community was there. I went, you know, I've always supported uh, the Saints. Yep. And I'm not a big baseball fan anymore. But I think it's it's part of the community that's important. And I've, I've known dozens of guys that played for them. And, and I always, you know, bought the banner and gave them deals and took care of them. And... Uh, there are how many towns are left that have their own baseball team? Not many. But and when you go cool up there and to watch a game and nobody's there, and I don't know why not. Is it because kids don't watch baseball? Is it because they're too involved in electronics? Is it because baseball is boring? Well, yes, of course, that's part of it. I can I talk about it all the time. Like, God, man, we got to go make it to a game. And it's fun to go, and, and you, know, you know, I know everybody there, yeah. you know, or pretty much, and and I know the fathers, of all the guys that are playing, and it, it's fun, you know, it, outside of the fact that you can't drink a beer there, it's it's just, it's wonderful. Yeah, and you can drink a beer in the, the outfield. The community, <laughs> the community has got something there that, they, uh, I hope they don't lose it. Yeah, same here. Same and, here. you know, once Phil is gone, I don't, I don't know who's going to drive that bus. Yeah, he beats the drum pretty hard for him, that's for sure. Oh, he's, and he's a great guy. Yeah. But that, you know, the, the, speaking of community, there's another thing that we don't support well enough anymore. It used to be that those the, that place was full. Yeah. That place was full. And I remember playing ball up there when I was a kid, playing ball at Hardy's Field with, uh, with the Scarab brothers, Marty and Denny. And I don't know, do you know Denny Scarab? I know Scarab? Denny, yeah. I always, for years, I've, I told people, 
that they couldn't complain about the prices at War Hardware. I know we're cheapest because Denny shops are. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love him. I've known him all my life. He's a good shit. Yeah. Don, what's next for you after the store is closed? When's the last day of the store? Saturday. Saturday's the last day of the well, store. Well, we're going to maintain a presence in the building uh, for insurance purposes. I'm going to be available as a consultant. This is a new idea. I'll do that. Uh, I've got, I've always been a pretty good, pretty big reader, but I got sucked down into the, you know, 15 to 20 books a, week, a, a year level. I really should be at the 50 to 60 book a, a year level. Um, so that's on the, that's on the agenda. I'm fascinated with foreign languages. I would like to get my French up to be the real thing, which I've tried to do now for 50 years or 60 years or however, 60 years, and never been successful. And I, I would, you know, dearly love that. Uh, I'd like to get my Spanish up to the point where if, if they needed somebody to sub at the high school for Spanish, they would just call me and say, you're the one. Uh, that That's a little bit further because my Spanish was all learned at the bar in Mexico <laughs> or lost in the back hills of Mexico, which is another collection of stories that probably shouldn't be public. But uh, that's why I always want to buy a half gallon of Kahlua because when you're in Mexico and a, Kahlua, a half gallon of Kahlua is like nine bucks or something like that, and you throw it on the, the back deck in the, in the back window of the car, and after about four hours, it gets up to be 110 degrees. And I want to tell you, if you want to get loaded fast. It sounds horrible. Oh, no, it's Kahlua. just it's just right. <laughs> And it, it goes down and it goes and just instantly. It's wonderful. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I would I want to I want to work on my languages. I got four guitars at home that keep calling me saying you promised me I, you were going to be a guitar player, and I've I've have not taken care of them pro proper, properly. And uh, so, uh, you know, I got, I got the hobbies like that. I used to be a model builder. I might look at that again because, you know, I've handled all those tools all these years and I know how to use them and I never did. Yeah. Because there were always other things to do. Uh, my health probably is going to keep me from drinking heavily. And... Uh, so I, I'm not going to waste away that way that so many other guys do when they they hit a hundred. That's right. And uh, I've been on a lose weight campaign. I've noticed for two years, and you're doing well. Um, I haven't gotten the first hundred off, but it's pretty close now. Good for you. And then one thing I desperately want to do is to walk the shore. Uh, it used to be, I, I, I had done, I've done this before, and I loved walking down the, the lake shore. And that was back in the period of Watson. I don't know if you remember Watson the dog. He was, uh, he, he was my stand-up comedian dog. He was hilarious. And um, we used to go, and we'd walk north, uh, from my house out past Magoon Creek and, and up in the, in the big high bluffs, by the high bluffs there, and where there really aren't any people, you know, there aren't any houses. And it, always, it was always hilarious because Watson would, would walk with me just so far, and then he'd say, bye, Dad, and he'd turn around and go home. <laughs> yes, he, he went as far as he wanted yeah. to go. And I'd get back, and he'd be sitting on the deck. Hey, where you been? <laughs> he was hilarious. A couple of Watson stories because he was 
he was such a character. Um, a woman one time, and this, this happened several times over the years because I've had dogs there so long. And, you know, it was always a pleasure to share my companions with other people. And they were expected to make other people happy, and they did. And one day a lady brought her little girl in, and the girl was terrified of dogs. And she brought him in, she brought the daughter in to meet Watson. And the girl was, you know, scared. And the lady said, it's okay, honey, Watson's not a real dog. And of course he did the right thing. He was so happy, you know. To be. Then there was the, the, the Barco story, but it's way before you. He was a Portuguese water dog too. And there was a, there was a, a family that, uh, from Chicago that had a uh, cottage up in Harbor Springs, big money people. And they stopped at the Hitching Post, and Barco was there. And their daughter had cerebral palsy, and she was in a in a wheelchair. She was heavily affected. And so every year when they went north, they would call ahead to make sure that Barco was there. So that they're, they, you know, I'd bring Barco in specialty, so he'd yeah. be there to say hi to the girl. Hmm. Great story. Great time with that. The dogs were awesome. They they just made so many people happy. A lot, lot happier than I made people. Well, I'm just going to interject there and say I think that you made a lot of people happy, Don, and you'll be missed. Uh, at I the keep hearing that. And I'm glad, you know, if, if, if it was the other way, I'd feel like shit. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd be sad if you, you spent 50 years doing something and nobody would miss you. Um, I can't do it anymore. It's, it was an Iron Man routine for the last seven years, and you just you can't, you can't do it. Well, now do the things that you want to do that you've been missing out on. I will. I will. I we'll think you're you. a damn good dude, brother. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. We might have to have a part two or even a part three. <laughs> I, I got stories that. Yeah, the one about the guy that owned the chain of uh, stripper bars in Florida. I got stories.